Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Monty Judah with Lion of Lamb Ministries. Welcome to our program. We are in a series teaching what I refer to as Messianic Teachings for Christians, and we've covered a number of topics already. Today's topic that I want to share with you, I'm sure will be very interesting and boring to you, is about the laws concerning clean and unclean and about what we call the dietary laws. Now, in a simple way, you're thinking, okay, he's going to talk about we can't eat pork, can't eat shellfish. Yes, you're right about that. But that's not all of what the Bible teaches about clean and unclean. That's the simple thing that you have been told. And most of you have been told that, hey, we don't have to follow that anymore. Uh, Jesus came and did away with all that. He declared all foods clean. Uh, that's a weakness for a person that would do that. And that's just something the Jews do. We Gentiles, we don't have to do that. Well, there's a couple of things I want to share with you today. I want to show you the background that this subject about clean and unclean doesn't start with the law of Moses. It started with creation. God has a definition for clean and unclean. If you recall the story of the flood and when Noah uh, came back from the flood, that he took certain clean animals and sacrificed them to the Lord and entered into the covenant we call the Noahic covenant. Uh, the sign of the covenant is the rainbow. And it was at that point that mankind, Noah and his descendants, were told they could eat meat. Prior to the flood, Mankind ate only a vegetable material. They did not eat animals. But as a result of the flood and the instructions that came from God at that time, that's when the idea of eating meat came into reality. But let me explain the first principle of clean and unclean and the first principle of eating clean, and clean animals that become food. It's found in Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. This is in the aftermath of the flood where God says, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. The first definition of clean and unclean and kosher has to do with what you do with the blood of the animal. Um, in a simple statement, if you just say the words, you shall not eat blood, you have just introduced the entire subject of the dietary laws. In other words, the first subject is not about pork and shellfish. The first subject is you don't get to eat the life of the animal, and it has to be a clean animal to begin with. And God is going to define what animals are clean and what are not clean. And this, so the first thing you have to know is what are the commandments about clean and unclean? Because I will just tell you, my friends, Christians have no idea what they are. Christians have no idea what the definition of clean and unclean means in the Bible. In this program, I'm hoping to introduce some of this to you. Do you remember when um, Isaac, uh, excuse me, Jacob was returning with his family? He had been with Laban, and he's coming back into the land again. He's going to have to face his brother Esau. And he had sent his family across, and he was there alone that night, and he had a wrestling match uh, with the Lord. And uh, as a result of that wrestling match, here's some of the things that came out. Of it. And this has something to do with what we call kosher. The term kosher means to be fit and proper. And this is how uh, clean and unclean you have to collect a clean animal. Then it has to be koshered. It has to be made fit and proper. Then you can call it food. And that's a whole nother step in this discussion. So let me read to you from Genesis 32, verse 24, and I'm going to explain kosher to you. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of a hip. What in the world is that about? 
Well, he's talking about the sciatic nerve. A kosher animal for uh, the people of Israel, you're not to eat the sciatic nerve that's in the back hip uh, that would extend down the thigh of the leg. And when you get a kosher butcher, if you ever hear about a kosher butcher shop, let me tell you what they're doing. They're taking that animal, and particularly on the rump portions of the animal, they're going through and cutting out the sciatic nerve of that animal. That's not to be eaten, even though it's a clean animal. So kosher meat means fit and proper, and this is one of the procedures that a professional kosher butcher would do. This is where this comes from. Most people don't even know about such a thing, but this is part of the instruction. When Moses began to instruct us, about the dietary laws and began to instruct us with regard to um, kosher, he began repeating exactly what God had said before. In Leviticus 3 and verse 17, it says, It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. In all your dwellings, you shall not eat any fat or blood. Now, let me add that to you. Where'd the fat thing come? All animals have what are called fat lobes in them uh, around the kidneys and so the, the fat will collect and it's the stored energy energy of the animal so that when they run out of food they, they're going to they're going to use that energy out of that fat and that will preserve them and continue to keep them well and fat lobes are forbidden just like blood um are you familiar with the what lard is lard is pig fat. And this world not only eats pig, which is unclean, but they even take the, the fat of the pig and they turn it into, for cooking purposes, it's called lard. And oh, by the way, if you're here in the United States, and you, particularly in the southern states, if you want to have the best biscuits you've ever had in your life, you're going to have biscuits that would cook, in, that had lard in them, and all kinds of other dishes that are common in the American dietary is lard. Now, in recent years, as more health-conscious eaters have come into the country, they've discovered, hey, eating lard is actually a very terrible thing for you to do. Eating pork is a terrible thing from a health standpoint for you to do. And a lot of people think, well, the reason why God gave these commandments was so that we would stay healthy. I, I don't have an argument against them, but that's not the real stated reason why God said, I want you to do this clean, unclean thing. I don't want you eating an unclean animal. As I'll share with you here very shortly, it's for a totally different reason that God gave the commandment. Let me go a little bit further as to what Moses gave. He also told us in Leviticus 7, verse, starting at verse 26, he said, you shall not eat any blood, either of a bird or an animal, in any of your dwellings. Any person who eats blood, even that person shall be cut off from his people. Again, let me explain something to you. This commandment about not eating blood is simply the head issue of the whole thing of clean and unclean for kosher. In other words, when I'm talking about the subject of kosher and I'm talking about clean and unclean, what is food and what is not food, we start with the original commandment, the life of the animal, the blood. The blood of a clean animal is not permitted for us to eat. The blood of an unclean animal, we are not permitted to be a part of it, is the life of the animal. God, who's the creator of all things, has said, you can eat the flesh of the animal so that you can live, but you will not eat the life of the animal. The life is in the blood. By the way, that's true of you and me too. I could have my whole arm severed and it wouldn't kill me, handicap me. But you take the blood out of my body, I'm dead. And generally, the average way a man in combat dies, he bleeds out. It's called bloodshed. It's the life of the man. As the blood leaks from him, he loses his life. His life is in the blood. Have you ever heard of blood sausage? This is somebody came up with the idea, let's eat blood. And they decided to make this goofy sausage, and they put blood in it. 
And so they're eating, purposely eating blood in this sausage for it. Absolutely, God says, absolutely forbidden. I don't care if it is a clean or an unclean animal. You cannot do that. Um, the whole idea of kosher is to vacate the blood from the animal. When you have a slaughterhouse where they take completely, forgive me for saying this, but i got to explain it. They take the complete head off of the animal. That is the proper way to take the animal apart, to butcher it. You let the heart pump the rest of the blood out of the animal, and that's how they would sacrifice the animals in the temple. They would cut its throat, allow the blood to vacate the animal, and the heart pumps the rest of the blood in the animal out of the animal, and that's when he loses his life. Well, in most warfare, either being shot or hit with a sword, or whatever, it's going to cause a wound that causes you to bleed. And when you die on the battlefield, it's because you bled out. You get hit in the heart, your heart stops, your blood's not flowing, you die. If blood is extremely important in the definition of what is alive and what is not alive. Um, have you heard about the slaughter of pigs in which that they don't take their head off? They hang them put a rope around their throat, and they raise them up, and they choke them to death. Guess where the blood stays? In the body, in the animal. So part of the blood thing is we say nothing strangled. Um, when you wring a chicken's neck, the blood is not vacated. To slaughter a chicken properly, you must take its head off, allow the blood to vacate from the body. Wringing a chicken's neck that blood is trapped in the body. That is not kosher. It has to do with the vacating of the blood from the animal that God says blood is very important to him. That belongs to him. That life of the animal belongs to him, and it needs to be returned to the earth. So we have um, additional instruction. Let me read to you from Leviticus 17 and verse 12. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, No person among you may eat blood, nor may any alien who sojourns among you eat blood. There's the commandment that says, You Gentiles are not supposed to eat blood. So when a man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens who sojourns among you in hunting catches a beast or a bird which may be eaten, that's a clean animal, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with the earth. You know what we call that? Field dressing. One of the things you learn as a hunter is that when you go out and you, say you shoot a deer, the first thing you're going to do is hoist that deer up, cut that thing open and remove its entrails and remove its heart and remove the blood from the animal. It's called field dressing. You don't haul the animal back intact with all of its entrails and all of its blood. You field dress it immediately. Remove the blood from the animal in the field. And so he's saying that's what must be done um, you, when you do a proper slaughter of an animal so it can be called food. Again, uh, chapter 17, verse 14, this is God's definition. For as for the life of all flesh, its blood is identified with its life. Therefore, I said to the sons of Israel, you are not to eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is in its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Do you remember me sharing with you from Acts chapter 15, the letter that was written to the Gentiles? You know, the Gentiles were coming into the faith, believing in the Messiah. They had this council meeting in Jerusalem. What are we going to do with these Gentiles that come in? Well, the Pharisees were saying, oh, they have to be circumcised to be saved. They have to keep the whole law of Moses to be saved. Well, that's not the doctrine of salvation. And they had this meeting, and as a result, it was clear that they were going to be received because they are saved by faith just like we are. We have to receive them as brethren. But then they said, well, there's something that they must do, though. And he wrote this letter, and three things he said in there. He said, number one, you have to abstain from idols. Okay, we got that. Second thing he said, you have to abstain from fornication. You cannot be involved in sexual perversion. Number th The last thing, number three, you ready? You have to abstain from blood and things strangled. 
Did you know the letter to the Gentiles commands you in the New Testament that you are to keep biblical kosher? You are to keep biblical clean and unclean. That's what that means. You see, if you understand what the commandment is that has been given, now you can understand what James is writing about. I have a lot of Christian friends. In fact, I have friends that I have breakfast with, Christian friends. And they get saw pork sausage and ham steaks and they eat pork bacon and so on. And they don't have the foggiest idea. As believers in the Messiah, for years, no one has ever taught them. By the way, God says he doesn't want anyone that belongs to him eating that stuff. He's going to go on a little bit further, and I'm going to give you a very quick review as best I can of the additional instructions that he gives. And we're going to get to the point where you're going to understand why does God call for that? Not for your health. You, you're, you're going to be here for a limited number of days. You're living in an environment that eventually you're going to physically die. He's not trying to extend your life by eating. There's another reason why he wants you to do it. Uh, Leviticus chapter 11 is what we call the kosher chapter from the Bible. This is when Moses flat goes through the list. It begins with these words. The Lord spoke against to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals which are on the earth. And he proceeds to define the animals on this earth that you can call clean, that after you kosher them, they may be food for you. If you take a cow and you don't kosher it, it's not food, according to God. If you take a dog, and you kosher it, it's still not food. We're talking about the definition of food. Let me tell you one of the statements that's in uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, that has sown a tremendous amount of confusion amongst the Christians, and that is the one where Yeshua is talking about that a man is not defiled by what he puts in his mouth. A man is defiled by what comes out of his heart. And he says, when you eat food, it goes into your body, and then it passes through your body as excrement. That doesn't defile you. Defilement is something that happens in your heart, and you may speak something or do something from your heart. That's what defiles you. Now, that was the lesson he was teaching. Guess what is written right after that? Thus, he declared all foods clean. What? The subject is not about foods. The subject is about how does man defile himself? And some well-meaning Christian back hundreds of years ago decided that he thought that's what that was talking about, and he wrote those words in. In fact, look in your Bible, and when you find those words at Mark 7, 19, you'll find there's a set of parentheses around them. That statement, thus he declared all foods clean. Put a little set of parentheses around it. Go to the front of your Bible, and it will tell you about the Bible you have, and it says this. Anytime you find a text that has some parentheses around it, that means that text was not in the original manuscripts that they have. That was added by some churchman, and it gets printed in the Bible. So the whole statement, thus he declared all foods clean, is a flat-out lie. That was never said by Yeshua. That's not the conclusion of that teaching. It's what was added by some Gentile Christians to justify eating unclean things. Instead of following the commandments of God, we'll have the Messiah nullify the commandments of God, which is what they like to teach, and thus those words are put in there. That is absolutely false information in the New Testament. Forgive me for being passionate about this. And maybe, you know, you're a bacon lover, and you like your pork chops and you like your lobster and your shrimp. I, I got it. But as I'm about ready to tell you, God says if you eat that stuff, you're not holy. You're unholy. Now, God has given us a central commandment right up there with the greatest commandment. 
He says, I, the Lord, am holy. I want you to be holy too. I want you to be holy like me. Let me assure you that the Messiah doesn't eat lobster, he doesn't eat shrimp, and he doesn't eat pork. And if you invite him to your house and you serve that, he is not sitting at the table with you, and he will not partake with you. And he's going to ask you the question, why are you eating that stuff? Don't you understand? I told you that is detestable. Detestable. I mean, if you want to make a comment about a food dish, have you ever seen those cooking shows? I love those things, you know, where they go and they critique the dish that they made and, and so forth. I've always wanted to be one of the judges on that. I, first of all, I love culinary stuff and I love cooking foods. I, I learn a lot from it. So we're, but especially when, if I could be a judge and those people went out and they cooked shrimp, okay? And, and if I was a judge and they brought the plate up to me, okay, well, Monty, why don't you judge us? Give us your comments on his cooking technique and so forth. You know what I would say? I would say the stuff that you put in this bowl on this plate, it's detestable. It's not worthy of even motioning to put this in my mouth. It is sickening. It's horrible. I don't know of a stronger word that the Bible can give you for that stuff. Just for the sake of kind of explaining things, unclean things that God has spoken against, they are, for the most part, they're the animals, the birds, and the fish that are prey on other animals, birds, and fish. And they are the ones who eat dead things. Literally, they're the ones that clean up the earth. You know, when a body dies, uh, an animal, and so they're the ones that come along and eat it and get rid of it. Uh, same thing in the sea. Lots of dead things fall. And so the sea is kept clean by they have the creatures that eat the dead stuff. Shrimp is nothing less than a bunch of sea spiders. They're spiders. Look at them. That, that's what they are. Lobsters, oh, I love this one. Lobsters are equivalent to cockroaches on the earth. Now let's sit down and let's have a plate full of spiders and cockroaches. How's that sound to you? That's the stuff coming out of the sea that you eat. That's what it is in the sea. Oh, because it wasn't on land that we can eat it. No, that's the Bible. It's very clear. These rules apply to animals on the earth. They apply to creatures in the sea, and they apply to birds, and they even apply to insects. He goes through here, and he explains all these different things as to, well, you would call them clean and unclean. Let me, uh, let me show you the verse where he talked about fish in particular, Leviticus 11. Verse 9, these you may eat whatever's in the water, all that have fins and scales, those in the water, in the seas, or in the rivers, you may eat. A fish has to have fins and scales. Very simple. You can have that. Can you have trout? Absolutely. Beautiful. Wonderful. And so forth. Can you have shark? No. They have fins, but no scales. And it goes through. You can go through the list of all the different kinds of creatures you can find in the sea, and you will easily be able to discern what is clean for me to eat and what is not. How about oysters? No fins and scales. Besides that, we all know that oysters are nothing different than just snot that comes out of the sea. It's detestable. It's sickening. People, for some reason, relish it. You know why? They're unholy. There is no wise they are anywhere similar to a holy God. They are going through the earth that he created, and they're eating stuff. He said, don't eat it. Just live in my world. I've provided all kinds of things for you. You can't find something clean to eat, to enjoy? No, no, let's, let's not do what the Lord said. Let's go find something bizarre to eat. Let's go do something that's weird uh, with regard to it. Um, he also gets into the subject of clean and unclean birds. And he gives a list of birds you're not supposed to eat. For example, the falcon, the kite, the eagle, the raven, the ostrich, the owl, a seagull, hawks, little owls, great owls, white owls, pelicans, vultures. 
How about we cook up for Thanksgiving a big old roasted vulture? By the way, did did that twinge you where you said, oh, I wouldn't do that. Oh, my gosh, that's sickening. You know why you sensed that it was sickening? Because it is. Only you've decided to make your own, your own um, clean and unclean list. Now, God's given us a clean and unclean list. You guys, you keep kosher. I've seen all kinds of Christians. You keep kosher. You just have different items on your list than from God's list. You've made your own list of what you call kosher, and you decided to put pig and lobster and shrimp on it. Now, by what authority did you have to change God's list of what is clean and unclean? Who, who told you you could do that? You're a believer of God. You're, you're committed to following God and believing in him. Who told you you could do that? You know who it was? It was the church fathers. It's a bunch of church leaders in the faith back years ago. They were Gentiles. Guess what they did? They ate all that stuff. They became believers, and they didn't want to give it up. They wanted to continue to eat the things they had been eating. And so the, you know what they just did? They took our faith, they took the commandments of the Lord, and they said, dismiss these other things. Let's have Jesus tell us all foods are clean. Let's have him say that, you know, you're, you're not subject to anybody else about that. You can eat whatever you want as long as you like it, because that's what they used to do. And they refused the commandment of the Lord, including the letter that was sent to the Gentiles. When the question was raised, what part of the law are the Gentile believers in the Messiah? What should they be keeping so that they can be in fellowship with us Jewish believers? You know that really, if I know that you understand these commandments and you're willfully breaking these commandments, I am prohibited from sitting at the same table with you. And the reason why I'm able to sit at the table with a lot of Christians is because they're all ignorant and they have no idea what the commandment is. And God teaches me, he was merciful to me when I didn't understand I'm supposed to extend mercy to others until they can't. And I'm hopefully supposed to get to the point, you will be interested in hearing the instruction of the Lord, and then I'll explain to you the commandments and how they work and why they're there so that you can begin to make the decision, I would rather obey the Lord than to follow the instructions of other men. That's what we're doing here, guys. I'm trying to encourage you that if if you would start listening to what the Lord really said and start obeying those things, it'd be better for you. But spiritually, you'd start walking in the light before the Lord. The Lord would be listening to your prayers. You would not be constantly in defiance of what God has said. I can just assure you right now, if you're in defiance of what God has said, he's not listening to your prayers. He's not going to do the things that you're expecting him to do. I believe the Lord loves us. I think he wants to do the best for us. But he also says, be holy like I'm holy. Walk with me, he says. Things will go much better. Um, in Leviticus 11, verse 20, he gives instruction about eating insects. By the way, you can eat insects. Kosher. You can eat locusts and you can eat grasshoppers. And in the Middle East, there's a lot of people that do eat them. You ever heard of fried grasshoppers? That, amazingly enough, they're clean. You can eat them, but you can't eat um, you can't eat um, um, winged insects. You can't eat, for example, um, um, wasps and bees. You're not permitted to do those. And in many cultures, especially in the Middle East, they do, part of their diet is sometimes insects to do it. So God's given some clarity with regard to that. Now, one of the things he says that if you come into some of this unclean stuff and you consume it, before God, you are unclean for the remainder of the day. He says, not until the beginning of the next day will you be considered clean before him. You make yourself unholy before God. 
for the rest of that day until the evening time comes. That's his rules. The same thing is true, kosher and unclean, has to do with how you deal, are you ready, with a funeral. When a, a person dies, if you come up and you touch that person, you've made yourself unclean. You are unclean until the end of that day before God. And in particularly in the ancient days, you could not go to the temple. You cannot come before God's presence in an unclean status. Did you know that kosher and, 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 and clean and unclean had to do with dealing with dead things? They do. And by the way, I would bet that all of you right now, that you, if you're out on the highway and your car runs over an armadillo, you probably would say, hey, uh, that doesn't qualify as food and that's detestable and we shouldn't touch that. You would be right. That's what the Bible says about that stuff. The Bible also says, interestingly enough, about we as human beings. There are certain things that come away from us that are unclean. You want to stay away from. For example, if a guy spits, that's unclean. The spittle is unclean. How about the snot that comes out of your nose? How are you know that's unclean? He coughs up some phlegm, unclean. Okay. Um, flakes off of your uh, dandruff, unclean. You're not supposed to be dealing with it. People don't want to touch that stuff. They don't want to be a part of it. I bleed. My blood comes into your contact. It's unclean to you. Obviously, the excrement from your body is very unclean to you. God has given these rules and said, don't do that. He's also gone farther with the clean and unclean. It is used in medical purposes. He said, if a person is contagious, you must quarantine them. You must avoid contact with them. Don't breathe the same air with them. St don't be staying in the same room with them. Just recently, we went through the pandemic. And one of the things that the health officials uh, had us do was to mask up and then do spatial separation for one another. I have to stay six feet, six feet away. Can't be in the rooms with these people. We have to avoid contact. Amen and amen. That is clean and unclean. Those are the laws of God. Did you know that? Now, here's, here's the irony. God has given us laws about clean and unclean for determination of food and how we prepare food. He's given us concerning medical issues. He's given to us and concerning how we deal with dead people, okay? Now, the irony of it is, is the Christians, they all know about the medical stuff, and they all know about the funeral stuff coming in contact with dead bodies. And they even know about the excrements that come out of your body. But for some reason, they've said, no, it doesn't apply to bacon. You don't understand how illogical that is? I mean, God was right on all this, and you agree with him. But over this one, you say, no, no, God's not right. I get to do that. It's ridiculous. Now, I, again, I apologize for my passion about this. But if you go and talk to some very sincere medical people, they'll tell you, you are what you eat. And if you eat a lot of pig, you're a pig. Does that sound like holy? Remember, let me take you back to what the Lord said. Eat the stuff I tell you to eat. You'll be holy. Eat the other stuff. You'll be unholy. Just look at the thing and ask the question, is that holy or unholy? Can a cow be holy? Yes. If it's brought into the temple, it's prepared, it can go on the altar. And it's holy. And you can make a feast out of it with the Lord. But don't be bringing a pig in. That would be unholy. Have you ever heard the story about the Maccabees and about the famous Greek general? And, and some people pronounce it Antiochus. I say Antiochus. And he wanted to take control of the temple in Jerusalem. And one of the things he did was he desecrated the altar. You know what he did? He sacrificed a pig on it. 
That altar at that moment became unholy and could not do another thing. They had to tear the stones down on it and rebuild the altar. Have you ever heard of the Feast of Dedication, what you call Hanukkah? Historically, what was happening there? That altar had been desecrated, made unholy. They had to remove it. They had to build a new one. They had to dedicate a new one. Why did they have to put a new altar in there? Because God said this unholy thing came into contact with it. Now, we have the biblical history of all that's going on. There is no question about God's attitude about this and, the, and, and people that follow God's commandments. This is clear. Now, here you are, uh, and I'm speaking to the Christians. Here you are. You're a believer of the King of Israel. You believe in God, the Creator God. You believe in the God, and you have a whole set of commandments that you keep. But for some reason, you've decided to take the Bible and make it a cut-and-paste Bible. You've picked out which commandments you like and left the others, and, and you've got this Bible that's full of holes. And that when I point out things to you that the Bible says that you're not doing, you say, oh, that didn't apply to me. Who told you that? God didn't tell you that. The Messiah didn't set that up. Apostle Paul didn't set that up. Who told you that? Maybe you should go back and ask. Whose commandments are you really following? By the way, let me just tell you, if you're not following the commandments of God, you're not a believer in him. If you're following some other commandments from another person who made themselves to be God to you, you're following that God. Boy, I would not want to walk in before the holy God and find out I had been following the commandments of another God. That is not going to be a good scene for you. This is a major area, brethren, of where there is a huge split between the people who claim to believe in the Messiah and claim to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and yet they are following instructions and laws somewhere else. And you do it daily, every time you sit down to eat. It's not just once in a while. This is your life. This is the way you do it. What you eat is who you are. Um, let me go ahead and give, fill you in on this. Moses doesn't just teach about kosher one time in the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, he again is going to repeat some of these specific commandments. He gives a little additional detail. The book of Deuteronomy means the repetition of the law. In in Hebrew, we consider the book, it's called Devarim. It means these are the words. These were the words that were spoken. So Moses gives you a slightly different slant on the commandments that were given in the form of these are the words of the commandment. And he begins in chapter 14, what I've been telling you. Verse 2, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession, out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, verse 3, you shall not eat any detestable thing. And he continues through the chapter explaining what are detestable things. And it's a repeat of the list from Leviticus chapter 11. Now, there's an interesting part of the commandments of kosher that you may have heard of, and that particularly in rabbinical Judaism, they do this. There are three times in the Torah it will make this expression, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Three times this is given. The first in Deuteronomy 14, verse 21, also in Exodus 23, at verse 19, and Exodus 34, at verse 36. In the other references, let me read to you what is actually repeated in Exodus twice. You shall bring the choice first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You are not to boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Okay, so what does that mean? You're not supposed to boil the kid in the mother's milk. Now, if you're involved with rabbinical Judaism, I'll, I'll explain to you what they say. That says, you're not permitted to have dairy, a dairy product, at the same time you're eating meat. They call it the commandment of separation from meat and dairy. 
If you've ever picked up one of those little coffee creamers and you look on the side, there's a little word that will be there. It says parv, P-A-R-V, parv, which means neither meat nor dairy. And that's how they can have cream in their coffee at the evening meal where they ate a steak. They are very diligent about We do not eat dairy with meat. You go to Israel on a tour, you're at the hotel. The breakfast is your dairy meal. You will not be eating meat. You'll be eating cheeses and little sali salads and eggs and things of that nature, but you will not be eating meat. You can't eat meat until in the midday meal or the evening meal. And they do so based on this. You can't mix dairy with it. Here's the problem. This is another example of what the Pharisees did. That's not what that verse is talking about. That is not a restriction of eating meat and dairy in the same meal. Let me tell you what it is. He's using the, the expression of what was in the land of Canaan when the children of Israel went into the land. All of the people that lived in there, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the whole, the Hittites, one of their great delicacies, one of the things they would make a big deal in a feast about was expressly cooking the goat, the kid, uh, the tasty part of the goat, in the mother's mouth. They made a big deal about this. It was bizarre. It was, it was incredible uh, in the form of it. Um, basically, God is saying the following commandment. When you go to eat, um, you eat the food so that you can live. I do not want you, when you go to eat, practice what other people do, where they do all these bizarre, weird things with food. If you are desecrating the animal that is giving you the tissue for you to eat, if you are desecrating those creatures that God made so that you could live to the point you're dishonoring them, you're not to do it. You are not to dishonor the rest of God's creation that he made for you. Think about it for a moment. We've got this young goat who uses the milk from the mother to nourish it so it can grow and live. And here we are taking that kid, and part of the instrument of, it, of preparing him for food is we take the very uh, item that was for his nourishment, and we use that against him. This is highly offensive to God. You need to be thinking about when you eat food that God created and put on this earth, you need to be thankful, and you better not be dishonoring the animal or the creature. God does not like people who hurt animals and little animals. He does not like them. And it comes to diet. We're not to do this. So when you decide to sit down for a nice banquet meal, and you say thank you to the Lord, you better make sure that the way they have put that meal together, that it's not dishonoring to any of the creatures that you're there eating. Don't do it. The Lord says, they belong to me. I'm giving them to you for food, but you will not dishonor what I have created. And it's about preserving life and understanding how life is supposed to work. He, uh, he's going to give some additional instructions and, and let me just kind of summarize some of this for you. Again, these are the instructions in the Law of Moses about this whole subject, clean and unclean, eating foods, and so forth. Let me take you back to Leviticus chapter 7, verse 21. There's a summary. When anyone touches anything unclean, whether human uncleanness or unclean animal, or any unclean detestable thing, and eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which belong to the Lord, that person will be cut off from his people. That's a quick summary of everything we've done with one other thing. He says, if you bring a sacrifice into me, you put it on my hall, altar, and we call it holy, and you weren't permitted to eat it, it was only the priest that was to eat that sacrifice, and you do, you've rendered yourself unclean. And he says further, if you do this openly, if you do any of this unclean openly in front of your brethren, you're supposed to be cut off. Get out. You're not part of us anymore. Separate from them. That's what the Lord has said. 
do not even associate with that person anymore. Quite honestly, if you're not willing to follow this simple commandment about what you eat and don't eat, what, what makes you think you're going to follow the bigger commandments? I can tell you right now, if you, if you won't learn this commandment, you're never going to get to the point of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might because you're demonstrating every day you, won't, you don't have the heart to obey him. And you're not using your wit and your strength to obey him. You're doing your own thing. And by the way, if you're not going to love God that level, there's a very good possibility you're not going to love your neighbors yourself. You're not committed. You're, you're not really committed to keeping the commandment. So we have this person in the assembly. He's with us, and he's demonstrated at this level of food, I'm not going to do it. Well, I can tell you right now, you are not going to love your neighbor with your life. In fact, you're going to present yourself as one of our brethren, and we're going to be trying to love you and get involved with you. And you know what? Basically, you're going to find the opportunity. You're just going to screw us. You're going to hurt us. So the Lord says, I want that person out of here. I do not want him in here where he can hurt people. Wow. Wow. You didn't realize eating bacon was that important to God, did you? Well, when you're in assembly and everybody's eating bacon, I guess you don't have that problem being cut off. But me, a person who's obeying the Lord and doing, trying to keep that commandment, I'm not supposed to be associated with you anymore. You're, you're, you're not believing in the God I believe in. You're doing your own thing. Now, for those of you who say, well, these are great commandments, so they really only apply to those Jewish guys. Well, let me read to you the commandments of clean and unclean, how they apply to every person. Numbers chapter 15, verse 15. As for the assembly, there shall be one statute for you and for the alien who sojourns with you, a perpetual statute throughout your generations. As you are, so the alien will be before the Lord. There is to be one law and one ordinance for you and for the alien who sojourns with you. I want to remind you that when God gave these commandments, at no time did he say, okay, all of you native born of Jacob, including all you Jews, I want you to stand over here. We're going to give you the Ten Commandments. God's going to come down on the mountain and speak the whole law of Moses to you, and that's what you're to follow. And then he didn't take the Gentiles, the aliens and sojourners, and put them over here and said, you don't have to worry about the law. That's just for the Jews. All those commandments are for them. You, all you have to do is love God and love everybody else. That didn't happen. What did happen is God spoke his commandments to everybody who can hear him. And then he said, there's one law for all of you, native-born, alien, and sojourner. And right now today, that applies to you, my friend, my Christian brother, you have the same commandments that I have to keep. There's no difference. You are no different in the kingdom from me. You are supposed to keep every one of these commandments. So we've talked about contagious diseases. We've talked about food that you can consume. And we've talked about um, uh, dealing with dead and, un and, and dead things. Let me share a really ironic thing with you. When I, I mentioned to you before, the Christians really have their own kosher list. You know, if, if I were to talk to you about sautéed mice, you'd agree with me. Oh, that's unclean. Let's not do that. But I talk about pork, and you say, no, 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 we can have it. You know, we've got refrigeration, blah, blah, blah. We can go ahead. Um, did you know there's something on God's list that's clean that the average Christian says is unclean? They, they've made a rule up that says, no, that's unclean. You know what it is? It's wine, beer, and spirits. Did you know God says those are clean? Those can be treated as food. But you Christians say, no, that's unclean. We can't have that. That's how far you have gone away from God's list of clean and unclean. You've actually taken clean things and made them unclean. That's how far you are from it. Did you know that wine was put on the altar every day. It's holy. It's called a libation. And the Lord says you will put a libation, a meal offering, and that morning lamb up on that altar every day to me. 
Well, here we are. Now, for those of you who are saying, well, Monty, I think you're saying I'm not saved if I eat pork. No, I'm not saying that at all. It doesn't have anything to do with salvation. What I'm saying to you is if you keep eating pork, you're going to go to heaven faster. You are going to destroy your life. And by the way, you will not be considered by God as holy. God will treat you as though you're unholy. I encourage you very greatly, brethren. You need to learn to obey the commandments of the Lord. There's a big difference between a messianic and your average Christian. And this is one of the areas where there's a huge diversity and a huge difference for us. I um, uh, offer Shabbat Shalom to all of you. And by the way, hang in with me now. I know this was a tough lesson. Next week, I've got something really special planned for you. I'm going to bring to you the very best description of Christians trying to explain my teaching to you as to why you shouldn't listen to it. I'm going to give you the argument of why you shouldn't listen to Monty from church leaders. I think you'll love that particular program. I'm looking forward to it. Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Thank you, folks, for viewing our broadcast here on the YouTube channel. I'd like to remind you, if you could hit that like or subscribe button for it, it's very helpful to our organization. And again, thank you for viewing our broadcast.